pray with our heads. Dearly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this family. Thank you for this church. Thank you for your truth. Father, when these things come together, you are glorified and just a beautiful amplification of your grace, your mercy, and your love. So we're just so grateful this morning, Father, to you for all that you've done for us, you continue to do for us, and even what you plan to do for us. Each day is exciting because we know that it's your plan. Father, we pray for those that can't be here or aren't here, that maybe should be. We pray that you heal them in whatever way necessary to bring them back to the fold so that we might fellowship in this sweet way with them as well. We pray also for those that are still lost in this world without hope that they be humbled, repent, receive saving faith before it's too late. We are most grateful and thankful, of course, for your son's work to cancel out that debt and to make times like this just times to be washed over, to worship you, to relax, to fellowship. We do just ask for your blessings on this message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Part 102, the book of Hebrews. Uh, last week, we got back to our mainstream study. We had a week off, if you recall. I want to reconnect where we left off. The Spirit has an awful lot to say, not surprisingly, on the topic of grace this morning. Go to Hebrews 4.15. Hebrews 4.15. We'll start there. Hebrews 4.15. This is a wonderful way to think about our relationship with Christ, what he is for us, who he is for us. For we do not have a high priest, Christ in view, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence, this is the sort of the punchline, the pinnacle of the chapter, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. That would be in old church times in that culture would have been to draw near to God. Draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And I was thinking about this um, one side note as well that the Spirit it's his timing, and he knows you better than I do. And it's just not peculiar, but interesting that we're still here. I mean, how many weeks has it been since we've been on verse 16? Like we kind of, you know, got through the chapter pretty well. And then he said, nope, stop. This congregation needs to spend a little more time on the topic of grace. And there's a real reason that we're going to get to this morning and uh, many times it doesn't become even wholly apparent to me until I finish my message and uh, you'll see but uh, that's an interesting thing for all of you to take pause and think about why is he spending so much time on grace this uh, this past couple of months even with this congregation I'll start here only a humble person, someone who understands their human weakness, will draw near to the throne of grace. That's the encouragement. Draw near in time of need so that you might find said grace. But it's interesting because only a humble person who understands their own weaknesses, human weakness, will ever draw near to God. They say, duh. But 
there's a reason, again, why he's having me teach grace once again to this congregation. So maybe it's you, instead of saying, duh, maybe he's trying to get through to you. Maybe there's something you're not doing. You're not doing the word of God, right? As James would say. You're not just hearing it and deluding yourselves. An arrogant person will shun this idea of drawing near to the throne of grace on the premise that they don't need it, that they are somehow righteous enough already and don't need God's help. So from last week, a key principle was we must be weak to receive God's grace properly. We must be weak. We must recognize our own weaknesses to receive God's grace. Thankfully, there are a lot of Christians who depend on God's grace for sanctification. But as the Spirit pointed out last week, even those Christians, even the well-intentioned ones, and I like to think of all of you as this group of individuals that have every good intention. I mean, most of you are here most of you are attentive. Most of you read the blogs. Most of you are, you know, so on and so forth, have good intentions. We're imperfect, so we fail, but that's not the point. Even those Christians, even you, can over-rotate on the topic of grace. And over, What I mean by over-rotate is you turn towards the truth, but then <laughs> you keep going and you miss the mark. So it's kind of like... You know, you're right here, it's true north, but since you slung shot into it because you were somewhere else, you went by and you missed on the other side now. And that's what I mean by over-rotate. You can overcook something good, and turn it into some perversion, right? So even, the, even well-intentioned Christians can over-rotate on the topic of grace. And that aberrant form of grace breeds something we call licentiousness, licentiousness. In other words, a license to sin. You know, the old attitude, well, since my sins have been paid for on the cross, it doesn't really matter what happens at this point. I can just go live like hell. And that's a, that's a serious problem for you. And that was the basis of this week's blog, All Things Are Lawful. From that blog is an excerpt. While Christ sacrifice covers the sins of God's children, this doesn't mean that we are given liberty to sin even more. We mustn't confuse our eternal position in Christ with our progressive sanctification while here on earth. Quote, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. That's Galatians 6-7. <clears throat> so don't be deceived like many are arguably the greatest area of Christian failure regarding licentiousness is with sexual sins you just have to look around I mean it's almost impossible not to see the mainstream treatment of sexual sins as if there was nothing wrong with them as if there was no uh, reaping what you sow in that area, as if it was just a freewheeling. And then Christians join the, the, the parade and say, well, my sins are paid for, so what does it matter? I'll just live like this and licentiousness and all will be well. No. So in a nutshell, it seems that some Christians believe that being forgiven of their sins at salvation means they have a newfound Liberty to sin all the more. Here's another excerpt from that blog. A believer's body is a temple of the Spirit of Christ. Jesus Christ purchased that temple with his own blood. There is no justifiable reason to defile it with sexual sins. I mean, it wouldn't be, in, if you really want to be frank, and even maybe graphic about it, it would be like in the Old Testament, a, a so-called godly man taking a prostitute right on the altar. 
and having sex right on the altar, in the temple. Except it's even worse than that, because the Holy Trinity indwells a believer in the church. So it's much more graphical than that. I hate to bring you there first thing in the morning, but that's the severity of what happens with sexual sin when you're a believer especially. So the conclusion, obviously, is that all things are not lawful, and especially when the greatest law of all is love. So that's one side of the narrow road of godliness. If you just think of godliness as, you know, the narrow road, the way that leads to life, right, the center line of, you know, living, behaving a certain way as a Christian. And I'm not being religious at all. This is God's word. That's one side of the narrow road where people over-rotate and fall into one side, like the gutter, so to speak. The other side, of course, is religiosity, where someone says, I'm going to be an ascetic, I'm going to make up all these rules, and I'm going to become this obnoxious, arrogant, religious person. That's the other side. Someone over-rotates on the adhering to God's law side, right? And all of a sudden they become like a Pharisee. So there's kind of two ways to miss the narrow road. Christians, in that sense, Christians over-rotate in the opposite direction and become like the Pharisees during Jesus' time. And they get on a works program, and you know how that goes. But the pivot, here's the focus of this morning, the pivot for both Christian errors is a person's understanding of biblical grace. Now, people would stay on the, the narrow road if they had a handle on biblical grace. They wouldn't over-rotate in either direction if they really had a handle on biblical grace. Not what they want grace to be, not even maybe what they've been taught in error in the past, but what it actually is as far as the Bible is concerned. So I use that term biblical very pointedly because there are lots of so-called Christian churches that teach a perverted form of grace, sadly. And to be honest, it's not that difficult to identify disciples of these types of churches because here's the thing, and you're going to say, oh, you're going to say they look the part on Sunday or they're out there, you know, sex and around. No. They're unmotivated. A person who has a perverted understanding of God's grace, of biblical grace, is unmotivated. The other things are symptoms. But deep in that person's heart, they are unmotivated. The more a person learns about biblical grace, the more motivated they become. People who cling, cling to an aberrant form of grace are so unmotivated, they are rightly called maybe lazy. They're so unmotivated, they don't want to do anything at least not for God. And that's what happens on either side of this road. There might be things happening, but it's not for God and to God's glory. And if you know anything about biblical grace, the whole reason he gives grace is for what? His glory. So another key principle from last week, grace isn't an excuse to be lazy. In fact, when you appreciate it properly, you are motivated more than ever to take full advantage of it. Does that make sense? The whole paradigm shifts. You say, wait a minute, I, you, wait a minute, you're giving me this thing to bring glory to you? You're giving me something I don't deserve to bring glory to you? Well, that's motivating. But if you don't look at grace that way, if you look at it as a cookie jar or some you know, license to sin or a license to become religious or whatever, you've missed the beauty of being properly motivated by just receiving it. So let me ask you this. What could be more inspiring in terms of getting out of bed in the morning than to understand God's grace in your life? that just waking up this morning and saying to yourself, oh, I don't know, the Lord still has a plan for me. He's given me this breath to breathe. 
He's given me a vehicle to drive to a church that's going to teach me more truth and then feed me. Right? I mean, is that not inspiring? He didn't have to do that for you. Really. That's where inspiration comes from. It's not about you. It's about what he's doing for you. So give that some thought this weekend. That brings us to a second key point from last week. Actually, a third one. When God gives us grace and we do receive it properly, we work with it diligently to multiply God's glory. In other words, it becomes something to us. It becomes a vehicle. It becomes an ability to do something more with your life. So that's what grace becomes to you. When you understand it properly, it's, it's a tool that he's given you to bring glory to him through your life, which is very unique. Remember last week and the week before, I think, the individuality of you all came out full force, that you all have been given a measure of faith, a measure of grace, a certain type of spiritual gift even, to bring glory to him. Again, if a person doesn't understand biblical grace, they will end up on one side of the narrow way or the other. They will either be licentious or hyper-religious. The very best attitude towards grace is how I closed last week, which was, grace is not a retirement plan, my friends. Rather, it is a call to work hard throughout the remainder of your days. And when I say work hard, I mean work hard. This isn't a retirement plan. You've been given the ability to go work. And some of you really are retired, like in the secular sense. And now you have all this time and good help. What are you doing? Now you have more opportunity, more grace given to you, because God didn't have to give you that life where you could retire. Some people never retire. Now what? Now what? This is not a retirement plan. It's an opportunity. We studied 1 Corinthians 15.10 last week, where the apostle Paul said, By the grace of God I am what I am. And you know what he said after that? I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. So there's this sort of juxtaposition of our labor, which is very real. Paul would hear, he'd say, just look at my body. Do you think this was real labor? With his scars and his limp and his everything else? Probably caved in cheek. Or skull, who knows? How about Jesus Christ with his scars? Think that was hard? Have you ever sweat blood when you've been under so much pressure to do something for God's glory with a grace given to you to do it? Ever done that? You want to tell one of these gentlemen that uh, it wasn't real work, that it wasn't hard work, that uh, Hey, listen, Jesus, listen, Paul, you should have just sat around like the rest of us and thought, hey, God's grace is here. I'm good. I'm going to go to heaven. I might as well just retire. Uh, You want to give Jesus that kind of advice when you see him? You want to give Paul that kind of advice when you see him? I don't. That's the point. I'm not trying to be, I'm only trying to convict you. That's all. So, I want the the Spirit with the Holy Scripture to convict you, though. So let's visit a few passages on this topic just to drive the point home. Go to, and there's no shortage. This is just a sampling in Holy Scripture. Go to 2 Corinthians 11, 23. So St. Paul that wrote, I am what I am by the grace of God, and I worked harder than any of them. No, not I, but the grace of God with me. Same guy, same attitude, same teacher, 
He was taught by Jesus himself, remember. 2 Corinthians 11, 23. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman. <laughs> with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Sound like a guy that sat around and retired from work for the Lord? Far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. You know, when you get beat down, you got to get back up, right? Think that's hard? Hmm. This is the Apostle Paul, of course, speaking to his hard work. As a result, here's the key this morning. I don't want this to turn into some kind of beatdown. We're talking about motivation. What the heck gets a guy off the ground when he's almost dead? Or keep treading water when he's about ready to drown? Or to keep walking for hundreds of miles with people trying to steal him, steal from him, rob him, beat him down some more? Um, it's about motivation. So Paul is speaking to his hard work as a result of being supremely motivated by his understanding of God's grace. Does he sound like a guy that says, Woohoo! And he's running around town with a cookie. Look at I got from God. Ooh, don't you wish you had some? And he's running around bragging, and you know, it's about him and it's about him getting his fair share of the cookie jar? Not even close. It's like a complete perversion of what grace is. That's not grace. That's not your attitude towards grace. It shouldn't be your attitude towards grace. That's the point. He was supremely motivated because of his understanding of biblical grace. And he was taught directly by Jesus Christ himself. Go to 2 Corinthians 12.11. 2 Corinthians 12, 11. That's the point the Spirit's making here this morning, so don't miss it. If you're all hung up on your own errors and you're still, I don't know, rolling around because of the blog, you know, all I can tell you is just, you know, get over yourself. Like, don't get stuck. Just because you've been convicted doesn't mean you get stuck and throw a tantrum and make things worse. He's trying to deliver you. This is how sanctification works. 2 Corinthians 12, 11. I have been a fool. You forced me to it, for I ought to have been commended by you, for I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing. Paul's saying, look, by the grace of God, I am what I am. I'm certainly not inferior to any one of these apostles. But yet, I'm not bragging, though I am nothing. Paul gives his audience some perspective, obviously, that it's not wrong to respect the apostles. If you think about it, it's not wrong to respect the apostles. We respect them to this day for their hard work that they had done. He did, too, uh, do hard work. But his point was that all this was accomplished, all this hard labor was accomplished through God's grace. So don't get puffy. A person who understands biblical grace <clears throat> doesn't take credit for it. Isn't preoccupied with that aspect of what's going on. They just say, what do I need to do today to bring glory to God? He woke me up. I've got a day in front of me. What is it, Lord? Go to 1 Corinthians 3.6. 1 Corinthians 3.6. Same guy. First Corinthians three, verse six. I worked, yep, I planted. Apollos did too. You guys keep perverting it, but I'm gonna straighten you out. God gave the growth. Oh yeah, Apollos and I, we really did work. But it's God that gives the growth. Or the, the growth. So there's this fusion 
of our labor with God's grace. And somehow, that's how God accomplishes his plan through mercies, or vessels of mercy. Paul was so motivated because he knew it was to God's glory, by grace through faith, as he wrote to the church at Ephesus. That should be on uh, <clears throat> repeat in your brain forevermore. By grace through faith, by grace through faith, by grace through faith. Even your salvation, your daily salvation, your salvation proper, by grace through faith, by grace through faith. Go to Colossians 1.29. Colossians 1.29. Colossians 1.29. So again, we're focused right now on motivation. <clears throat> and Paul is a perfect example for us to consider. Colossians 1.29. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. So I toil, that means... Uh, hard labor, hard work, but with all his energy. In other words, a reference to God's power by grace through faith. And so there's this, again, there's this fusion. We don't show up with nothing. That's a perversion of grace. To say you just get to go like this, at the end of the day, and that's it. God saved me, so I just get to retire in my recliner over here. That's a perversion of grace. Sadly, that's taught pretty mainstream nowadays in so-called Christian churches. And here's the kicker. As a real pastor with a real spiritual gift, my heart breaks because these people are misleading people who end up completely unmotivated. And because they're unmotivated, they don't even necessarily want to get out of bed in the morning. They don't have any like energy. They don't have any inspiration. Their purpose, what is their purpose? Go to 2 Corinthians 3.4. 2 Corinthians 3.4. We're not even done. And this is one guy. Same guy. Over and over, from circumstance to circumstance, Paul taught this topic that I'm teaching this morning to you. That you have to understand biblical grace. If you don't, you will be unmotivated. All kinds of perversions come from it. Licentiousness, religiosity, you name it. 2 Corinthians 3, 4, Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. So hopefully you're seeing a pattern here with Paul's writing. He's saying, yeah, I worked my tail off. People are trying to kill me. I dust myself off and kept going. But I thank God for His grace. Because without his grace, I wouldn't be able to do those things. One more. Go to Philippians 2.12. Philippians 2.12. So hopefully you see this pattern that the Spirit's trying to teach you, just like Paul was trying to teach the churches back in his day. You have to understand grace. If you're suffering from motivation in, the, in your spiritual walk, chances are you've lost sight of grace, or maybe you've never really had it. You had some version of it in your head. And he's doing you the favor by setting you straight. So you will have motivation. So that your life will be filled with a joy that Jesus Christ promised. That your joy may be fill, full. Philippians 2.12 Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, 
work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I forget the word. I think it's um, something like catechismi in the Greek. And it basically says to labor, to actually work it out, that there's labor involved. You don't, you're not a passive retiree in the spiritual life. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you. You see it? You work out, but yet it's God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In other words, he gives you grace to work with for his good pleasure. If you, if you have a spiritual gift and you never use it, can you imagine? All right, let me, I'm not saying I'm just unbelievable great pastor in this bull. But can you imagine this guy, you, most of you know me for a decade and a half now, behind a pulpit, going, oh yeah, I got this spiritual gift, but I, I don't feel like using it. The last 15, poof, 15 years gone. What kind of tragedy would that be? Would that be a tragedy? Some of you are like, not really. <laughs> Seriously, what kind of tragedy would that be? If this guy said, you know what, yeah, I get it. I got, I got a spiritual gift, but I'm not going to exercise it. Or every time someone comes up against me, which is countless at the, these days, right? Bad mouths me, you know, slanders me, whatever. Slanders you guys, whatever. And I just quit. I don't dust myself off. I don't, like, push through and keep plugging. Would that not be a tragedy? To be given a spiritual gift, which has to be by grace, and only by grace, and then not use it. That's what the Spirit's getting at. And say, but then why did you use it? Honestly, because I understand what true grace looks like. I'm more motivated now than I've ever been. Why? Because I understand, the more I grow, listen, I'm growing too, right? The more I grow in His grace and knowledge, the more motivated I am. So Sundays become this the best day of my week by far. Like when I wake up on a Sunday morning, I'm like, oh, I get to go teach today. I get to go be with the family, right? And break bread. And I don't know if I told you, but we're going to have food today. <laughs> right? It's the best day of the week. Why am I motivated like that? Because this job's not easy. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, so to speak. Tough calling, right? Why do I have that? Why do I get out of bed? Why am I motivated? Be like a sicko? No. Because that's what love looks like. That's what grace looks like. And when you have a handle on it, you're motivated. You're like, are you kidding me, man? Let's do this thing. So with Paul, you see the same vigor, the same attitude towards those he was teaching. Why? Because he understood grace. So hopefully you see the pattern. We work by grace through faith, both of which are gifts from God, by the way. Paul wrote abundantly about grace in the New Testament. And here's my question. Why do you think that is? Why did Paul have to write? And I've taught you this many times. The gospel's simple. Right? And if you read, the, especially the New Testament, let's just isolate to the New Testament. If you read what the New Testament's about, it's either reaffirming the simplicity of the gospel or defending it. And I would argue as a pastor that the defense part is the more complicated part because people come to the table with all these weird notions about this, that, perversions about grace, perversions about love, perversions about God, perversions about Jesus Christ, all these weird perversions, and a pastor has to sort of help unravel that. And say, no, 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 you're wrong. Think about it this way. Think about it that way. Right? Why did Paul have to spend so much time defending the gospel? I'll give you a hint. Because Satan and the kingdom of darkness aren't dumb. <laughs> That's why. The, the gospel is very simple. I mean, quite simple. It's just human beings show up with all these weird perversions about what they think and who they think God is and how, and the only truth is right here. That's why most people just go to their grave in ignorance 
many of them unsaved. If you're going to undermine an organization the size of the body of Christ, then one of the most efficient and effective ways to do it is to undermine a core doctrine. Grace is at the very heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, it's directly tied to the overall plan of God for the ages. I'll give you some Holy Scripture to chew on before we get back to Hebrews. Um, go to Romans 9.22. Romans 9.22. So if you were Satan and you were antagonistic to God's intentions to bring glory to himself, because remember, Satan wants glory to himself, so he's jealous. If you're going to try to thwart that plan, what are you going to do? Is there a better place to start than with grace? To subvert, to lie about, to pervert the doctrine of grace? To get so-called Christians peddling a perverted form of grace? That sounds like a pretty savvy strategy to me. Romans 9.22 <clears throat> What if God, now we're looking big picture, plan for the ages. What did God have in, plan by, in mind, by the way, from eternity past? What was he trying to do? We don't have all the answers, but we know certain things are true. What was he doing? Like, why didn't he just create us all, like, you know, infallible, and we ne you know, we, there was never any evil in this world, and all that stuff. And we have our answer right here, and there's a reason for it. There's a plus side, believe it or not, to him ordaining. He's not the author of evil, but he let it exist. There's a reason why he let it, and continues to let it, exist in this world. And he's, Paul wrote right here, Paul, same guy, understood grace, was moved by it, was motivated by it, Romans 9.22, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, so he has an end goal in view, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath, prepared for destruction, which means he knew from eternity past who was going to hell, in order, why would he do that? In order, in other, in other words, because to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. So in other words, he ordained, big picture, he ordained both the polar ends, good and evil, right? And he used vessels prepared for destruction on the evil side and vessels prepared for glory on the good side. Even us, whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles, meaning that he saves from all categories and walks of life. So do you see how the overarching plan for the ages that God desires to bring glory to himself is literally based on grace? I'm going to explain it. But that passage I just read with you is all about grace. It's all about grace. The whole thing. Romans 9 gives us the backdrop that God uses to amplify His grace. His love, even, for His children. As I've taught many times in the past, this chapter reveals what man does without God's grace. In the absence of God's grace in a human being's life, they go directly to hell. They are literally prepared from eternity past for destruction. That's what life for a human being looks like in the absence of God's grace. And God said, I'm going to leave it. And I'm going to tell of it. And I'm going to tell my children 
what it looks like without my grace in their life. And then juxtaposed to that scene is what man does with God's grace. Here's what happens when I do grace you out, when I do save you, not just positionally, but progressively and then ultimately. Here's what it looks like when grace does come on the scene. I get to choose. You don't, don't judge me. I'm the sovereign Lord. You don't say, oh, it's not. We'll get into that. How many times have we gotten into that the past few years? That's not what's in view here. What's in view here is like us trying to figure out motivation. So you get to, presumably, most or all of you in here are on this side of the fence where you've received God's grace. But yet, in Holy Scripture, it's recorded those who are without God's grace. He says, you see these two things? Now do you understand my grace? Now you're getting a better glimpse into what my grace can do for undeserving human beings? The chasm in between is what amplifies God's point. It's the chasm. And when you realize how far grace has taken you against those without it, you're motivated. You have a better understanding of the, the value, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the amplitude of God's grace. Without this side, how would you know this much about this side? I'll give you some analogies. and My analogies are never perfect, so just bear with it. <clears throat> suppose, and some of you are like, yay, suppose I was to give you right now $100. And take this very personally, you personally. I come up to you, I'm like, I'm so excited about this lasagna, I just feel like giving. I go, Here's 100 bucks, right? And you're like, yay. You'd probably say, wow, that's pretty generous. But what if later on you found out that I gave everybody else in the congregation $100,000? What would you say about the $100 that you got after you find that out? Here's another example. <clears throat> what if I give a 10-year-old child a choice? I give them a brand new PlayStation 5 with 100 games stacked in front of them. And then I say, you can either have that or you can have this 1794 flowing hair silver dollar in this plastic case. So you got a little, a little coin. Or all this. Right? Which one's a child going to choose? Number one. Say, Man, I got PlayStation with 100 games. Are you serious right now? Heck, what, what is that thing? But what if once that person reached 18 years old, where I could have a real conversation, I come back and inform them that the 1794 flowing hair silver dollar in the plastic case sold at auction in 2022 for $12 million. What does that do to that person's psyche in that moment? The point is that understanding the value of God's grace is premised on understanding what we are without it or with other alternatives. And God does us this big favor. He says, I gave you grace. And you're like, eh, it's like a hundred bucks. Eh, man, it was nice. You gave me a PlayStation with some games. Yay, God. But then you find out what it was without it. You understand? Actually, the better example is I, gave you, I would have given you $12 million 
Without it, you get a PlayStation. You get the point? It's about magnitude. It's about God giving us the backdrop of what life without grace looks like versus what grace in your life does look like. And here's how far between these two things are. Now, to circle back to the instigating point, when you understand the value of God's currency, grace, in this life, you want to spend it. You say, oh, so wait a minute, you're going to give me something of infinite value that I don't earn or deserve? You're going to give me something called grace? And you're going to give me life, a lifetime to spend it? When do we start? Now I get it. I get the value of grace. And when I look at my Uncle Jimmy, who's still in this bucket, but yet I understand the value of what it means to be in this bucket, and you're going to give me more time on this earth to try to evangelize Uncle Jimmy before it's too late, are you more or less uh, motivated by understanding how much grace means, the value of grace in a human's life? You say you only have a lifetime to do it in. Some of you are like, I don't know, man. I just got, you know, I just reach over in that recliner, click, and my feet shoot out, and I don't want to. I don't even. I just say, oh, it's Uncle Jimmy calling. Voicemail. I'm too busy being retired. Come on, man. You don't understand grace, then. That's essentially what it comes down to, because if you did, there's no way in hell. You'd want to do anything to do with retiring spiritually. Like, not even close. You'd be like, how do I spend this stuff to help others? To live for others. You know, like Jesus said, right? Greater love is known than this. They lay down his life for others, blah, blah, blah. You think he's just like quipping, like, hey, hey, take my saying and put it on a, 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 a poster with an eagle. <laughs> or, you know, nobody? Or, or, you know, get somebody, get an artist to paint a nice cross. No, the three crosses. That's, you know, paint the three crosses and put, greater love is no one than this, and one die, lays down his life for his friends. Oh, it's so awesome. Or does he want you to get off your ass? Not to be crass. But for real. Do you want you to retire and look at a, a, a poster? Or does he actually want you to take the grace that he's given you, understanding the value of it, being motivated by it because you understand the value of it. And some of you are like, I, I, because you don't understand the value of it. When you understand the value of it, you're motivated. That's why I said at the start of this message, you, it's easy to see somebody who doesn't understand God's grace because they're not motivated. They really are thinking they're in a retirement home. They really do think that a, a ticket to heaven means they get to kick their feet up and retire. Whew, that was a tough race. I ran there. But I'm going. Good luck, everybody else. I'll be in my armchair rooting for you, eating popcorn. But I'm not trying to convict you for not doing this. I'm trying to teach you the reason for motivation. The reason why understanding God's grace, biblical grace, matters. We see it manifest in Jesus Christ first and foremost, but also in his disciples like Paul, Peter, John, and so on. Even this vessel. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm just saying you're looking at somebody who got out of bed excited to spend his grace. As I alluded to last time, Jesus, who taught Paul directly, taught the same principle during his ministry on earth. For example, the parable of the ten miners. Go to Luke 19.12. Luke 19.12. We're going to read three parables. One's somewhat lengthy and two are very short. But it's Jesus saying the same thing. He's talking about his grace. He's putting his grace on full display, saying this is what happens when someone does understand the value of grace and functions with it and works hard with it and is motivated with it. And here's what happens when someone doesn't use grace. Luke 19, 12, 
He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten miners and said to them, Engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. Doing business would be working with said grace. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your miner has made ten miners more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in very little, you should have authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, Lord, your miner has made five miners. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. And then another came saying, Lord, here is your miner, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. Uh Uh-oh. I was in my recliner. I thought thought this was retirement time. For I was afraid of you. Oh my gosh, this is getting worse. I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man. He's speaking like a man at this point. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. So says you, right? Why why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest even. How do you at least do that? I was too busy in my recliner. Blaming other people. Why I'm not. Spending your grace. He said to those who stood by, take the miner from him and give it to the one who has the ten. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten miners. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. In other words, these people didn't want the presence of grace in their life at all. So slaughter them. That's this bucket. That's the human condition without any of God's grace. And then the pinnacle of using God's grace, doing business with God's grace, is the one who made ten minus, made the most of his or her life, and then was given even more. That's, those are the endpoints of no grace in the life of a human being and then someone who uses grace to God's glory. <clears throat> That's not the only parable Jesus taught on the subject. How about the parable of the hidden treasure? Go to Matthew 13, 44. Matthew 13, 44. Some of you are like, oh man, this is like another convicting. I didn't spend, I got like one half of one minor, I think. You're missing the point. You're missing the point. This is, a, this is indicative of a person who doesn't understand God's grace. Why did the person who made ten minors did business with what, what he or her was given? Why did he end up with ten minors? Because they were properly motivated. They understood the value of doing that business doing said business with the grace that God gave them. And that's what pleased God. That's, it's not about you being all like, oh, you know, I'm so convicted. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the armchair person. Maybe you are. But the Spirit's taking it one level deeper than that. It's not a beatdown. It's why. If you've answered that in your heart this morning, the question on the table is Why? Why are you in the recliner? Why do you think that grace is a license to retire? That's the question. Matthew 13, 44, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy... He goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. He says, nothing else. You know, it's like when Jesus said, you must deny yourself, 
right, to follow me. Same thing. Same teacher, by the way, obviously. <laughs> Said, I, nothing else matters. I mean, what's my life without him? Once I see Jesus Christ, I mean, what's my life without him? How about one more parable? The parable of the pearl of great value. You go to Matthew 13, 45, right around the corner, right? Matthew 13. Why is everybody flipping pages? Isn't it like the next verse? Diane, isn't it like the next verse? Where are you going? Hey, let's talk to Diane for a moment. Where are you going? Are you got a different Bible? You got verse uh, 44.5? Again, look at Jesus, same teacher. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. He said, my whole life pales in value to God's grace, to what God can do in my life. If I cling to myself, my self-life, this is terrible as an alternative to what God can do by grace, through faith. That's the parable. Are you not motivated by that? Were, were these individuals who sold everything to buy into God's grace, to receive God's form of currency? I've taught this, right? The almighty dollar is the currency in our economic system here in the United States. But in God's world, it's grace. His currency is grace. Satan's creature credit. People trade with creature credit. What's my street value? What's my reputation? What's my value to the world? That's creature credit. God, grace. I am what I am by the grace of God. You want to keep pouring it into my lap abundantly? I'm going to keep spending it. Woohoo! And every time I spend it, it's to your glory. How motivating is that? Versus over here, you have to upkeep what? You got to stay on social media to keep your reputation up. You got to keep certain friends in your circle. You got to do certain things. You got to have certain things. You got to buy certain things. You got to work at a certain job. You got to have a trophy spouse. You got to have all these. What? That's a lot of work. This one, it's, God says, I'm just going to give you grace. As long as you spend it well, I'm going to keep giving you grace. How's that sound? And I get to bring glory to you? Yep. Where do I sign up? Every day. Lord, where do I sign? That's a, uh, what is that casting crown song, right? Um, let my light shine. At the end of the day, I want you to sign your name, I think that's how it goes. Every day. Where do I sign up, Lord? How do I do this thing? Because this is... Those parables were Jesus' way of describing someone who understands the value of God's grace. Let me just read slowly the last few principles before I close. These are the ones that I've presented this morning throughout. Number one, grace isn't an excuse to be lazy. In fact, when you appreciate it properly, you are motivated more than ever to take full advantage of it. Number two, when God gives us grace and we receive it properly, we work with it diligently to multiply God's glory. Number three, grace is not a retirement plan, my friends. Rather, it's a call to work hard throughout the remainder of your days. And then finally, when you understand the value of God's currency, grace, in this life, you want to spend it. We ended last Sunday with the following call to action. Ask yourself, am I using God's grace to his glory? And I said this at the outset of this message, right? It's not peculiar, but it's interesting why the Spirit hasn't let us get past 
verse 16 of chapter 4 in Hebrews, where you go to the throne of grace. Why? The question for you apparently is, am I using God's grace to his glory? Or are you stuck? Do you have a perverted sense of what biblical grace is? And therefore, are unmotivated to use God's grace to his glory. That's what the Spirit's getting at. Why are you not motivated? Forget about what you're not doing specifically. Go one level deeper. Ask yourself, why am I not motivated? And what I'm telling you as a vessel on behalf of the Lord is that you don't understand grace. Somewhere along the line, you either made it up, you got it from the world, or you got it some, from some perverted pulpit somewhere. I don't know. I'm not here to judge. I'm just saying that is my discernment for this congregation. <laughs> you all have to answer that question for yourselves. I cannot answer that question for you. I am just a messenger. What is it that's keeping you from being motivated, truly motivated, to spend God's currency and bring glory to God? So, my encouragement, take your time with it. Apparently, this is extremely important for you all to spend time with. Ask yourself, what is it? I'm telling you, I'm giving you the, the roadmap to figuring it out. If something is awry in your soul regarding grace. Or, to be fair, you might be relatively new to the faith. But have you seen the average age of this congregation? Most people in this congregation have been at it for quite a while. But to be fair, if you're still a babe in Christ, don't be too hard on yourself. Because it does take a little time. But if you've been at this for a long time and you think you got it nailed, but yet you get convicted by messages like this, this one's for you. The Spirit's saying, spend some time with it. Raise your hand if you want to be motivated. Right? Everybody, yeah, I want to get out of bed. I get out of bed like this. Ooh. Right? Oh, it's another day. I got to go to work. When am I going to be able to retire? Let me look at my financial calculator. Nope, still got 100 years left. <laughs> I'm never retiring, apparently. You're missing the point. It's not about retiring. Take that. There's nothing in the Bible that says about retiring anyways. I wrote a blog on that, but some of you got mad at me. I'm retired. It's between you and the Lord. I'm just throwing it out there. It's not in the Bible. Just throwing it out there. Kill the messenger. I'm not about spiritual retirement. What really matters. Anyway, you get the point, right? I just need a little laugh out of you because you guys are getting pretty serious. Saying, you, know, you gotta eat still. I don't want anybody choking because I'm <laughs> <laughs> staring me down over there. I try to eat my quiche or whatever's back there. But anyways, love you all. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the truth that sets us free. We just ask for your blessings as we take the things we've learned back to the privacy of our own souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen.